I'm going to start my timer and leave five minutes for questions at the end. So for the pe a couple of people who were uh, here um, about 10 minutes ago, the demo worked. I'll just uh, put that out there. And I'll, and I'll get to the demo pretty quickly. Uh, here. But anyway, so today's lesson, teaching a robot to play Angry Birds. I'm Jason Huggins, uh, co-founder, co-creator of the Selenium Project, also co-founder at Sauce Labs. Um, it's based in San Francisco. I live in Chicago. It's a long story, but um, a cool, hipster, buzzword compliant company. Right, so you should follow me on Twitter, and that's my email address as well. Yes, I think I need two more to get to 3,000, so like, who gets to be number three? Big old 3K. Anyway, this project that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, it's the, the official name of it, the official domain is bitbeam.org. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this, but roughly it's uh, the technology that I've used to build robots that play Angry Birds. So how the heck did I get here? So uh, one thing, a brief history of time, in the beginning of, of you know, the Earth cooled, the dinosaurs roamed the Earth, uh, I was born, and I was really big into robots. In the early 80s, it was really, really cool, because um, there was this, it wasn't just robots were cool, there was also like, this heightened cultural sense of fear that robots were going to take over everyone's jobs. Um, and they actually did in the automobile industry, but, uh, but you could go to Radio Shack and buy little things like this, the Armatron. Uh, does anyone have an Armatron? Does no one, I'm the, okay, yes, okay, great. So there's me and him. Um, you can buy it, I think, for like 30 bucks on eBay. Um, I, 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 every time I check it, I'm temp, I have to not buy one. But uh, anyway, so that's really cool. I'm really into robots. And I'm kind of happy that they're kind of back now. Uh, but it's like a once every 10 years kind of a thing. So this was like, that was my, my childhood. And this is my, my uh, youngest son, Declan. He's playing with the, the actual Armatron from my youth. But this picture was only taken like six months old. And he found a way to actually break the little gripper hand. So I do need to buy one off of eBay. So uh, robots really weren't a thing in the late 80s and then the 90s, but then all of a sudden the late 90s, the dot-com boom happened, and then Sony came out, I think it was Sony, right? Honda is Osimo, the walking person, and then uh, Sony is the robot dog. So this is Ibo. Does anyone own an Ibo? I'd be really impressed. I don't, I, I don't own one. Own one. Uh, so I had this thing like, okay, one, this realization that robots are back in style again from the 80s now to the 90s. And I'm right out of college. It was a great time uh, to be alive. And I had, well, I'll skip ahead here, or skip back. I had this idea like, well, okay, Sony is a bunch of really smart engineers. Um, and I want to do a robot thing, a robot company. So I'm going to let them own the land animal market. I am going to handle all aquatic robots. So I, I'm a collector of domains, so I registered aquaticrobotics.com. I had a, a product name, it was going to be Chipperfish, and it was going to be this whole thing. And uh, I, I, like, I actually went for like a good t one or two years thinking I'm actually going to start a robotic fish company. I'm not kidding. And, uh, but I was totally screwed because I realized I knew nothing about mechanics. I knew nothing about electronics. I knew a little bit of software. But then on top of that, the, you know, the, 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 the trifecta of it for being screwed for this kind of a project, I knew nothing about how to make motors run underwater. So. Uh, but, but, I, I, but I still really kind of tried and you know, throw myself at the project. I even went to the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, bought all these kind of books on, um, I think the fancy phrase is mimetic engineering. There's a couple of places in Boston and Texas where uh, the idea is to mimic nature. So if you want to come up with a more efficient boat or submarine, instead of just putting a big old thing underwater, actually start making things swim like a fish, and then you can use less fuel. So it's actually the Navy, I'm sure, is funding half of this research. But medic engineering. One of the things I learned from all of these papers that um, um, I was able to, to read is that fish swim in a sine wave fashion. That's how they're so um, efficient. And if you're wondering what the heck does all of this have to do with selenium, I'll get to that at the very end. Anyway, uh, so, <laughs> so um, but the fish swimming thing has nothing to do with selenium. So, so um, I started to actually model uh, and do software simulations of the fish swimming sine wave thing. And then I had kind of like this, uh, not exactly an epiphany, but kind of like this frustration that I'm doing, th I'm actually doing 3D simulations uh, of a sine wave, uh, but it's actually it's trapped on this, trapped behind this two dimensional piece of glass. I thought that was kind of ironic that I'm doing 3D on 2D, but I really wanted to do 2D. Meanwhile, sitting right next to my desk, I had this other thing that was really popular in the 80s, uh, pin art. I'm going to stop asking if people have these things. It's depressing. But uh, pin art is this really cool thing. You can kind of put your face in it, your hand in it, or any other kind of thing, maybe your elbow, whatever. Uh, and it just sits there. And so I had this idea, wait a second, it, for, for me to, this, this 
epiphany, non-epiphany, whatever you want to call it, um, to take, could I, maybe, to, to do my simulated sine wave thing in actual 3D, well, what if I, well, the idea is to motorize pin art. If I can motorize every single one of those pins, I could create my fish swimming simulation thing. So this became the cooler tangent project from the fish swimming thing. Um, I don't know if you've heard, you know, there's that phrase of, you know, art is never finished, it's always abandoned. So I abandoned the robot art, uh, fish project, became now obsessed with motorized pin art. And this has actually been my obsession since 99. It's kind of sad, right, actually. But uh, uh, anyway, so still going. And this is still kind of totally side project, you know, getting married, having kids, selenium, all of this stuff. And this was still in the back of my brain, festering as this thing that needs to get created. And I did, um, again, from a, a robot -y kind of point of view, everything is, it's really kind of a triathlon of activities, of, of mental exercises. You have the software, the electronics, and the mechanics. So I, being a software guy, I started with the software. So if you go to pinthing.com, you actually will, this does work if you type in, I'm not really good at the whole marketing things in the sense of I didn't put anything on there. and You, you don't even know that you're supposed to type that command. It's just a blank console. Uh, but this is, uh, slightly related to web testing because I implemented this using the 3.js library which does 3D rendering using Canvas under the, so it's HTML5 Canvas tag and that's kind of quote unquote untestable. So I kind of actually did this as a little bit of an exercise of like how would Selenium actually be able to test an untestable you know, uh, Canvas app. So I did, I did have a couple of uh, ideas around that. I gave, I gave a talk a couple years ago, you know, um, the future of testing and how to prevent it. And that was roughly in the, in the context of if everyone moves to Canvas-based applications, how would you do it? But I won't go into there. Anyway, pin thing, solve the software problem. Then let's say I'll just, I solve the electronics thing because of Arduino, that's awesome. I won't even talk about that. It's just electronics, yay, very cool, Arduino, done. The last part then, with the software done, the electronics done, um, I really actually stumbled for a couple of years, but just with the mechanics. I really didn't know how to get all of these things to work. You can buy, the fancy phrase for that motorized pin art thing is a linear actuator. If you, you want a linear motion, problem is they sell them for a lot of money because you would only buy like two or three to do some fancy scientific setup to pipette fluids into test tubes or whatever. But I need thousands of them, so there's no way I'm gonna go tell Somebody asks somebody, like, hey, I know it's $1,000. Will you just sell it to me for 50 cents? So I had to invent my own linear actuators. But I didn't know how to do it. Um, anyway, so kind of put the project on hold and live the rest of my life. Then I went to the Maker Faire in, in 2010. This kind of symbolizes the Maker Faire. Has anyone ever been to, like, a Burning Man? Uh, they, they, they kind of joke about Maker Faire as kind of like Burning Man, but it's like a, the family-friendly version. Uh, or the other thing is kind of like, if you can imagine what the Renaissance Fair is going to be like in 500 years when they reenact what life was like now, that's what the Maker Fair is now. Anyway, I don't hope that makes sense. But it's really, really cool and a whole bunch of geeks uh, doing all kinds of crazy stuff like making dragons that breathe fire. At that fair, this is in the San Francisco, San, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, met the grid beam guys. Again, I could give a whole talk on this. This is actually the sad thing about these guys is that uh, they, they, they said, like, um, they knew they were living in the future, but they didn't realize they were living 20 years in the future. So they created this stuff 20 years ago, but now it's, I think now it's, it's, it's right time. It's kind of sort of like an open source erector set thing, but you can, these are some grid beam components. The cool thing about it is you can use it to build stuff, like real stuff, uh, big things like beds or shelves. Um, the guys who actually created it, Richard and Phil Jurgensen in Northern California, they, they built the first solar-powered train out of grid beam, steel beams, not wood, and uh, they built cars, all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, but so that, that's kind of this big scale stuff. And again, still, I bought the book, still sat on my shelf uh, for a year until I kind of um, picked up the whole, oh yeah, sorry, this is Richard Jurgensen in his workshop. I went to go visit him. The other really cool thing about this project, I don't know if you can see this right here with my pointer, is that is a lamp. This is, unfortunately, he moved it out of the picture, but that is, the, that is the world's coolest lamp ever. So at that far corner is like this lamp head that's like four feet wide. And um, anyway, I need to get a picture of that. But so, so the picture of this, the reason why I asked him to, I commissioned this picture, standing desks are kind of like um, a thing that's popular with kids these days. So I figured, oh, hey, you could, um, 
I'm trying to help them out and market this stuff. And so, like, hey, maybe people, you could encourage people to make standing desks out of grid beam. Anyway, still, none of this is Selenium related, right? Okay, so moving on. Um, so I uh, went, got back to the pin thing project, and I actually created, I finally figured out what the linear actuator was going to be. Uh, so this is the, the clicker, the first prototype. And I made it out of Lego. And then I was like, okay, finally, I have my linear actuator. I can make these pretty cheap. But Lego's kind of expensive, and I kind of wanted to do it in different kind of parts. Also kind of imagine, it's not just the motorized pin art. I'm at, like, what I'm kind of looking at is potentially, like, imagine an entire tabletop of all these pins that can go up maybe, like, two to three feet. You could render, like, the Grand Canyon, like, in actual 3D. Kind of, kind of, one, of the, one of my descriptions of the project is kind of like, you know, Google Earth for the blind. Like, how would you show a blind person what, Google, what Grand Canyon was like? But you could render all these pins. Anyway, so I imagine like the scale is slightly bigger than, than uh, Lego, but anyway, I had, I finally had my Lego, my linear actuator design in Lego. Time for me to port that to different materials, and then I had, uh, it was frustrating, I'll just sum it up that way, and then I realized, oh, I've got this grid beam book. Um, instead of kind of starting over with all the geometry of porting everything that works um, angle-wise and size-wise with Lego, and move that to real materials. Um, what if I just ported Lego to new materials, and then I can do it in sizes like you know this this beam? Lego doesn't make a beam that long, so and it's cheaper to make and all these kinds of things. So once I uh, I discovered uh, whatever you want to call it, um, if you scale down grid beam to Lego size proportions, Lego is accidentally grid beam compatible. Kind of this weird thing. Um, I'll actually kind of get into like the sizes, but one of the things about this the clicker, the reason why this went from I'm only 10 minutes in, so I'm finally switching to, wow, how the hell is this relevant to this project? When I was holding this little uh, clicker thing in my hand, I have it uh, in the other bag. I'll show you after a break. Still linear actuator. But then, walking around the house, so proud of myself that I finally had my thing, the clicker, I actually then held it upside down, randomly, and then spun it again, and then it realized that that's kind of like a clicking motion. So what originally was going to be my 3D simulation you know, display pixel, upside down is something that clicks, button, clicks buttons. And I was thinking, oh, you know, second epiphany of this project. Um, that's kind of like what Selenium does. You know, there's a context of set, setting up a, a web page, but at some point, really, all it does is click buttons all day long. So now this went from a complete back burner, back burner, back burner, had no... Uh, plausibility of ever paying my bills. Uh, I, I joke that the project, uh, it, didn't never, it never passed the wife test. I can never say, hello, honey, I'm going to quit my job and just do this full time. Uh, so that, that she's like, no, 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 just keep doing the testing thing. So uh, once I realized this thing actually could be kind of like a testing instrument, this became slightly more relevant, kind of more day job related. So this is kind of a zoom in on, uh, on a bit beam. I laser cut it out of basswood. So this is wood. Some people um, they are like, why did you use this weird tan colored plastic or steel or something? Uh, no, it's wood. Laser cut at Tech Shop, San Francisco. And um, again, I live in Chicago, but it's a long story. Anyway, so membership uh, at Tech Shop, San Francisco. And I, I have these beams. So at the bottom, that's a Lego Technic beam. At the top, right there, the diagonal, that's a bit beam. The three, there's only three magical things you need to do to be Lego Technic compatible be 5 16th inches wide, 8 millimeters, the distance between the holes, and that really is actually square. 5 16th inches is like 7.9999 millimeters. Anyway, that's, that's, that's what it is. And then the whole diameter is 4.8 millimeters. You do those three things, boom, you're Lego Technic compatible. Uh, so it's, this is my uh, oldest son, Finley, and he's, uh, I actually created an iPad stand out of this stuff, try to figure out what else could I do with it. And uh, he was, I think my iPad stand is on the left, and he's counting the holes to figure out uh, how to build it himself. So um, I, I fit, if you go to bitbeam.org, I officially call this the building, uh, bitbeam is building toys for grown-ups. I added the grown-ups part because these beams snap in half pretty quickly, as my kids um, showed me several times. Uh, so until I move to different materials, um, it's just adults only. Um, anyway. Um, so, so with all of this, here's kind of the setup for slightly, slightly more relevant top uh, topics here. Selenium is a software-based robot. I never realized this. I was a robot fan my whole life, and I thought I was completely distracting myself by, you know, being a good adult and paying my bills by having a decent job and doing this boring, boring, boring testing thing and realizing, oh my god, I've been doing robots this whole time. So, but the, here's, here's the trick. Um, you know, with that inside of that little clicker, you know, the idea is now Maybe I could have used that clicker to do desktop browsers, uh, Firefox, IE, 
that I could have done that. Maybe I could have had it over the keyboard, and that would have been you know uh, mostly ridiculous, totally ridiculous. But with mobile, actually, with all these touch screens, there actually is an argument to be made that especially as these things come out, this you know, wave after wave of new devices, a lot of them don't come out with SDKs, qu uh, testing uh, ACKs quickly enough, that sometimes all you need, I'm sure a lot of people have just gotten to the point where, you know what, all I want is just something over the top and just you know, clicks it once to just make sure like, just something works. I suspect also that, um, that all of the device makers, they all in some secret lab at Apple or Motorola, they all have something like this, but it's a competitive advantage to make sure when they're testing their capacitive glass technology that they don't, anyway, this is all secret stuff. So I, I know there are people, and they're actually paid to do this, but they're, they're all hidden behind firewalls and stuff like that. Anyway, so the hypothesis is, uh, could I make actually testing totally awesome and cool if I take it out of the 2D screen and put it in a robot? And you know why not power it with the Selenium API, just a cherry on top kind of thing. So that, that's the hypothesis. So my unscientific method was really, again, this triathlon of mental activities. The electronics with Arduino, that's right here. Uh, you can buy it in the US at Radio Shack. I suspect Maplins would be kind of the equivalent. Maybe they have a deal with them. But either way, you can just go get it anywhere. Arduino is awesome. If you've never heard of it, you've heard of it now, go get one. It's really cool. Uh, Bitbeam, I've finally now solved the mechanical problem part of my project. And then with the software, um, uh, my kind of go-to Swiss Army knife is Python usually. And then I'm going to throw in uh, OpenCV because it's not just enough to click a button. I have to recognize what's going on in the screen because uh, that's, you know, to be a good test-minded person. So I'll, I'll show you a demo of that. I'm going to blast through this. This is a version one of my Bitbeam bot. I showed it off last November. It was a different style of robot. A classic, I used stepper motors, you can kind of see in the background. Uh, it was a cl classic kind of a CNC machine. One motor drives each X, you know, X, Y, and Z, three motors. You saw that. This was highly edited. The video, the, the, this video was like 30 seconds. And uh, the, the big feedback from version one of my robot was that it was too slow. So someone on Twitter followed me, Jay Graves. He sent me a tweet saying, yeah, good job on making a robot that plays Angry Birds. But it's, uh, it's ridiculously slow. You can make it faster. But, so you should check out this thing called Delta Robots. So this, what you're seeing, is actually kind of generation two. This is actually, well, maybe technically generation three, because I made some mods uh, about five hours ago. I added, kind of stiffened it up here, added the plank so it doesn't walk off the table anymore. That was something I kind of, because uh, it's kind of like a leg. It kind of, anyway, it now stays put. So Delta's totally awesome. You should Google the phrase, uh, like, Delta Robot Pancake Stacking. And it's the craziest, scariest video you've ever seen. Anyway. So this is, this is version 2. And actually, yeah, so what you're seeing here is version 3. Up on screen is version 2. Those, those dangly arms are at, the, at the end uh, just wasn't very stable. Has anyone ever seen uh, the cover art for the book War of the Worlds? Yeah, it's kind of like that. I didn't realize that. So it really is creepy looking. I don't know how to make it more kid-friendly, but here you go. And that's kind of a, uh, a zoom in here. So I broke protocol. I never even showed you that demo. So let's actually switch to demos now. So I'm going to do, uh, again, this project, I'm coming at it from two different angles. The, the dream is for it to basically, I sit back, and then the robot just does the whole presentation. I'm not there yet. So, oh man, this mouse. I'm just going to move that over here and over here. Oh yeah, I forgot to show you, like, kind of what a motorized pin art thing would look like, but I'm running out of time, so... Ask me later. It's actually a really cool video. Nine Inch Nails only song. Right. So moving on. Let's do a demo. So I implemented a couple of methods. And I'm already at the right screen, so I'm just going to do this. And the moment of truth. 20 minutes in. You ready? Who thinks it'll... OK, OK. <laughs> Raise your hands if you, if you think it'll actually succeed. Okay, no, okay, that's no fun. Who, think, who thinks I will miserably fail? Okay, great. <laughs> Here we go. Drum roll. Did it! Yes! Yeah, in the peanut gallery, right? One star. So can you bring down the lights for the video mode? There's the glare right in the middle there. Whoever's up in the booth. Yes, all right. 
But if it didn't work, I've got a couple of tricks up my sleeve. Aha. Uh -huh. Move that over. And do that again. So this morning, is Adam Christian here? Where's Adam? Oh, he might be actually at the, at the sauce booth. Anyway, he said, like, dude, you kind of need this to be like in some kind of demo mode so you can kind of talk and have this off. So I, I just did this at lunch. Does this work? Wait, no. I have to do this first. OK, now I think I can do this. OK, slide. Let's see. OK, so now, hands free. All right. Yay. All right. <laughs> well, let's see. One star. And then this is where a lot of dirty secrets get unveil unveiled. I now have a time sleep for 15 seconds that will kick in in like three, two, one, and hit the repeat button. So this is terrible, terrible ghetto testing. I'm not going to show you the code, <laughs> but do not do what I did. So a little bit wizard behind the curtain kind of stuff going on there. So that, that, is my, that is my Angry Birds playing robot, right? Um, but that's not all, right? So I've got, again, this is flying blind. This is how the, the worst way to do automated testing, barely better than manual, when you just expect at a certain time to go blindly to a certain location and just do something. And if the screen was different, if that, if that didn't actually uh, kill the pig, um, the, that loop command would have failed on that last repeat because it wouldn't have been done yet. Uh, so th the way to fix this then is to add some kind of way to introspect the, the page or the, the screen. Um, and it's no fun to do it with Selenium. You can kind of do that. Actually, if you go, um, this makes it kind of web appropriate, not just native game apps. Uh, Chrome.angrybirds.com, you can play Angry Birds as a Canvas-based application uh, in, in Google Chrome. Anyway, so, so this is my robot for like kind of output interacting with the screen. I want to also play with the you know, input. So I've got this thing called, uh, well, there's a company called um, Epifan. They make this thing called, you know, prosaically named VGA to USB. So with an iPad 2 and up, uh, iPhone 4S and up, you get pure video uh, mirroring out. And I spin that out to this little uh, device here, and then that becomes uh, an input through USB into my computer. Anyway, I'm going to show you that demo. So I've got tab 2. And where am I? Projects. Skynet. Terminator Vision. All right. So I was hoping to get that kind of red translucence to apply to it, uh, but I didn't, I didn't get there yet. Uh, so you can see that it's running in the background. I'll, actually, I'll show you the, the, the code for this. And it's, it has, it's looking for the bird. And do I have that? Oh, I moved that over here, didn't I? It's looking for this guy. I'm not sure if I'm... It's looking for a little ping file, PNG file, this little bird. And it doesn't see it on screen. But here we go. I'll see if it actually finds it. And yes, it is. Uh, most OpenCV demos just do a rectangle, but I figured a crosshairs was a little bit more creepy and fun. Uh, <laughs> this is a circle and then a straight line, straight line. Anyway, and then with the translucence, then it's super awesome. But you notice it actually found it, right? And if I move it over, it kind of notice that the XY uh, changes as well. The $300 version of this little VGA to USB thing, uh, it's like eight frames per second. So when I move it around pretty fast, you can kind of see that, that um, lag. And if you're really Angry Birds aficionado, uh, when you cheat on YouTube and you can't see some of, the, some of the videos that kind of have this kind of lag, it's, they're using this device to record their game play. Anyway, if I upgrade to uh, the $800 version, it gets 30 frames per second. But either way, you can kind of see that it, it does find the, uh, the element after a while. And here is, here is where uh, things get really interesting. This actually is an, an example of you know, the coolness about the web driver and the Selenium 2 architecture. But what we do is we ask the browser where an element is. We get an absolute screen XY coordinate. And then we ask the operating system to click there. So what I'm hoping to do is to go into the guts of the project and then um, interrogate, well, two things. Two, two interesting things, what I'm still trying to get to. This, this is my roadmap here. Um, I want to implement, still on my roadmap, the, the, the implement the uh, find element by PNG file. I want that in the project. Is anyone uh, familiar with a project called Sekuli? Right. Excellent. Way more than, yeah, like a year or two ago. 
There's also uh, some commercial products called eggplant and some other things. Anyway, they all use uh, OpenCV. So I, I want to I wanna nick that and put that into the project. And the other thing then is to, when it does find the element on the screen, instead of asking Windows or OS X, I ask Bitbeam bot to click. So those two things I kind of want to add to the project. It's kind of my way to kind of get a tour of the code base and, and go in there. But this X, Y coordinate, once I have that, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of in the, in the home stretch here. So, uh, so that, that there's the, that's kind of where the projects are going. I really wish I had some alpha version where you could say, aha, download the plans for this robot, and here's the jar with select element by ping file. I'm getting there. So, uh, so yeah, watch the space. Um, let's see, I've got some other... One of the other things I realized is, as far as trying to come up with kind of a test suite for this for this robot, you know, kind of, uh, I realized that actually picking Angry Birds as a first demo is kind of a ridiculously stupid idea. It's way complicated. So I do have uh, one other demo. I think I'm, I'm going to realize that, or what I'm doing is trying to simplify the, the, the domain. So I figured, okay, actually, tic-tac-toe is a little bit simpler, where I want to keep coming at it from different angles, where I can recognize more simpler things that with less motion on screen, and then have uh, a simpler uh, target for the robot to get to. Um, and then maybe even a simpler version of this is where I just draw a rectangle and recognize a rectangle. Oh, actually, what's the name of that really popular game now? Draw Something? If I could have this play Draw Something automatically, that would be kind of fun. And see if people guess that a robot's doing it. Um, anyway, so, so I have some other kind of methods here. Let's see, I'm going to cancel this, go back here, go to this different view. Also, I, you probably have already figured it out, but that's just the cam from my laptop, right? So I'm going to play tic-tac-toe with my robot. Has anyone ever seen War Games, that movie? Another popular movie? Right, okay. So it's also, have you ever seen Star Wars, Let the Wookiee Win, right? As a good life strategy wonderful API that I've... Oh! I'm going to help it out here. Oh, okay, never mind. All right, like I said, let the Wookiee win. Oh, I don't know if you can hear that. It's, there's some built-in applause there. Uh, so the robot wins, and I'm now, you know, once I'm lucky with one game, but now twice I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm building out my... my uh, armament of, of video games that I can play. The other thing is actually, this is kind of like, this is a thing in, in the Selenium community. Uh, Dave Hunt uh, last year opened the conference with his um, how to play, uh, shoot, helicopter? What's the name of the game, right? And this also started way back at the beginning of time when Google had their Google Doodle for Pac-Man. Um, I kind of, I don't know how it started, but it was some like, I think I just said some tweets saying, ah, oh, that'd be kind of funny if someone could play Pac-Man with uh, selenium. So you did, and you and somebody else, like, who, I don't know who else. Uh, yeah, 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 so that was awesome. So now, like, this whole getting selenium to play video games, that's a thing. And if you're, like, in on the cool scene, like, you will also try to figure out how to one-up Dave and my robots and uh, try to figure out how to play video games with, uh, with WebDriver. So uh, that kind of brings the fun and the excitement and the awesomeness into an otherwise totally dry topic of software test automation, right? Um, I don't know if I have any other slides. I think I do, and I'm going to bring up my presentation to uh, jog my memory. I th did I close it? No, I minimized it, didn't I? Robots. Hello. Thank you. That's my five-minute warning. Yes, URLs. You are required to show URLs. You can download the Bitbeam uh, files, uh, and these are other kind of links to the things I created. I want to do one thing in the 60 seconds I have before I want to open it up to Q&A. I want to show you some code. I promised you that. If I can get back to my screen. Um, screwing this up. Oh, right. I'm going to... Sorry, guys. You can see that, right? Maybe in the 30 seconds I have left? Projects, what was it? I want to show you the Skynet stuff, right? Skynet, Terminator Vision. That's what I want to do. So going back to that demo, that it's looking for the red, it's opening the Redberg PNG file. Uh, I also really don't want to take all of Sakuli. I just want to go right after that, you know, the guts of the OpenCV library stuff. So these are the Python bindings into that project. Um, Let's see, create a window. 
I'm actually then, this is where I, I pull the Epifan device and get a frame. Where does the magic happen? So, so grab, here's the frame. I'm just going to show you this. Here we are, match template. This is the two, one line of code that actually finds uh, the bird on there. It doesn't actually find it, it just gives kind of like a confidence interval. So it's kind of like min and max and it's just kind of fuzzy. And so you have these two things and you just kind of triangulate the center of that. And from there, then draw rectangles around it. So my plan is perhaps not the Python stuff, but there are Java bindings or even C++ bindings to kind of get this stuff and jack it into a web driver and then not tell Simon about it and just uh, see if anyone notices. So uh, anyway, so it's not really a, a, a truly technical geeky talk until I show you some codes. There you go. And I will now open it up to questions. All right, thank you. Go all Lego all the time. Well, they don't make parts like um, so. This, these um, like these these twenty sevens, uh, the twenty seven holes, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they don't make anything larger than than twenty. Um, right now, the, the the wood is weaker than the plastic. But um, if I want to do something a little bit more complicated, I imagine I want some version of this that is plastic, but also maybe aluminum or steel or something like that or carbon fiber, something kind of cool. So I can do different materials, uh, but also different sizes. Because I imagine, uh, I kind of look at this as, uh, in my crazy mind, like 1977 Apple computer. There's one way where I want to go to it where it's big. The other place where I want to go to it is where it's small. Because the smaller I can make the pins, the higher the resolution. So Lego is Lego, and then there's, they go up to Duplo and stuff. But I want to go smaller. I don't even know what you call that, micro beam or something like that. But so there's a certain level of I want to kind of choose my own adventure and I want to go up and down size scale wise. And so now that I'm out of Lego, I have now that kind of future freedom to do that. Uh, th there's a good argument that I ain't going to need it, but hey, anyway. And it's cheaper. I can buy these parts, these pieces of wood. This whole thing, like wood materials wise, is probably like maybe 20 bucks. You add on the Arduino, that gets you up to about. Uh, so let's see, plus 30, so we're at 50. The three servos, that's another 30. Eh, I'll just roll it all up saying like you know, about 100 bucks. Um, if I had to source all of this stuff, especially for this pin thing, um, at lots and lots of Legos, their markup is ridiculously huge. Um, anyway, yes? Was this appropriately selenium related? <laughs> yes? Um, can you repeat the question? Uh, if you're asking a question, oh, right. Yes, the first one, why not Lego, right? Okay, so the long, second. Long term, where do you see where this going? Where is this long term? Yeah, one year, five years. Well, there's, there, there's a, there's like, the, the open CV, like there's two angles to it. There's the ridiculously silly component to it of this little robotic arm thing. And that I think we'll, I'll just try to keep that as fun as possible and ridiculous as possible. And if it's not ridiculous, I'll make it more ridiculous. But there's a really uh, serious part, that whole open computer vision, the Epifan stuff. Like one thing I want to do, that's 300 bucks or 700 bucks for a relevant one. I'd rather get a Raspberry Pi for 30 bucks, reverse engineer the VGA protocol, and then make some equivalent of that component to get the video out to be $30 instead of $800. So I'm putting those guys on notice, sorry. Going to disrupt you, um, but it would be nice to have a completely open source um, kind of system here. Um, so I, I think from a you know, imagine a whole bunch of fr from a serious point of view for mobile testing, you want to do well. You don't want to do, but what's possible cheaply is simulators and emulators. Um, as a enterprising entrepreneur, uh, you know, I want to put real devices up in the cloud and, and rent them out to you. Um, I hope to put all of these devices up there and then get the video out. So you can, you'll probably actually control it through the SDK, through the USB cable, but you'll be able to get live video out, live screenshots, kind of like really good, kind of um, wholesome, raw telemetry out of what the screen is, uh, is seeing. So I really kind of use this as like a, um, especially the video stuff, the output stuff, as uh, kind of the research and development on how, how you're going to do mobile testing on real devices. 
uh, not just the emulators. Because the emulators are, are easy. If it's on your screen, you can take a screenshot. But once it's actually out into a real device, how the heck do you get that out there? You could do cameras, and people do do that. But with this whole video out thing, I think that's where that's where it's like kind of scarily you know day job related um, kind of stuff. The robot stuff that's just silly. All right. No more questions. One more question. All right. We're done. Simon. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, I enjoyed seeing a robot actually use an iPad better than I do. But I'm no good at Angry Birds. Who is? Um, Cool, excellent. We've got five minutes uh, while Christian just gets himself set up. Um, so you can stretch your legs, or now's a chance to think about going to track B, um, or you can stay here and listen to Christian. Is there a strap on